everybody. It's good to be here tonight. Um, thanks, Dave, for the introduction and the opportunity to speak to all of you. Uh, I am in two of those categories uh, in that I'm doing a startup right now, and I have done a startup in the past. Um, I spent uh, the last couple years or so at Google after they acquired a product called MeasureMap uh, that uh, we built at a company called Adaptive Path. MeasureMap was a blog analytics tool uh, that uh, we kind of used the user experience we had developed as part of the redesign of Google Analytics. And how many of you are using Google Analytics for your products? Okay, great, that's fantastic. Um, so what uh, I'm happy that Dave uh, sort of put these packets together, uh, Dave and Leonard put these packets together to um, talk about design after this, because that's exactly what I want to help you do. Um, it would be design. Design. It would be, uh, um, you know, easy for me to give you tips and tricks about, you know, like do the top five design mistakes and things like that. I think that's pretty well covered out on the web. Like when you look around, there's always like what fonts you should be using and things like that. So I kind of don't want to talk about typography tonight. I kind of don't want to talk about color. I don't want to talk about layout and grid systems and this, how severe the Swiss are with their design and <laughs> things like that. Um, because that's kind of the stuff that people think about when they think about design all the time. What I want to talk about is how you guys talk about design when you're developing your products. And uh, one thing I've learned in my career, I've been doing design work for about 15 years, and I've seen kind of every, every place I've been and everywhere that I'm working on products is that every single person has an opinion about design about what they like and what they don't like. Uh, few people are really able to execute on that, but they kind of know it when they see it, right? And what I've constantly tried to do is to help people with the vocabulary that they have about design so that they can talk about what they like in a way that's productive and, and kind of can take the very, very subjective things that we believe about design and have objective conversations about that. So I want to talk about that a little bit. I want to start with talking about something that kind of has bothered me about design and really about sort of startups and what's been happening in the, in the last few years. And that is just kind of how derivative everything has been. And I think that uh, user experience is the term I tend to use when I talk about design. User experience is the point of differentiation for most of the sort of at least consumer level startups these days, it's uh, that's a that's an assumption that I have. I think um, like innovating on deeply in technology at the consumer level is is possible, but a lot of startups have been really focused on innovating in the user experience, and what that leads to is a lot of de derivative work. And I want to talk a little bit about that and how to avoid that, and how to again give you the vocabulary to talk about that. And I want to do that by way of example. I'm sure many of you have heard of cargo cults. It's a phenomenon that is, um, frankly, bizarre. Um, and it has a lot to say about the product development we do. And if you haven't heard about it, I'll give you a little background. 1941, right, Japan bombs Pearl Harbor, and, um, and America kind of goes to war, right? So um, when that happened, uh, a tremendous number of Americans uh, and their technology, which was some of the most sophisticated technology in the kind of got on boats and headed to the South Pacific, right? Where they took all of this stuff and unloaded it on these islands and met indigenous people who had not only never seen technology like this before, but frankly had never seen white people before. And it led to, as you can imagine, a lot of conflict, but also some symbiosis, right? Um, and they sort of lived with one another for three or four years. Um, one of the things that the indigenous people noticed was that these white people with their technology would have these giant airplanes land on the island every so often and unload a bunch of stuff, food and clothes and medicine and things that they need, needed. Uh, and they watched this happening without really having a deep understanding of why that was. So eventually, right, the war ends, all the Americans get back on their boats and they leave, and the airplanes stop coming. And the indigenous people think, where's all this stuff? How do we get this stuff, right? And so what they did was they mimicked the behavior that they saw around them. And they began to build their own airstrips. And they began to do these rituals, right, where they would like make bamboo um, like headsets and talk into microphones and ask for the airplanes to come back, because that's what they saw the white guys doing. And it worked for them, so they kept doing that, right? Building these elaborate systems and following these, these sort of rituals to figure out how to get the, the wealth to keep coming back to them, right? How to get this stuff to keep coming. Um, this remarkably continues to happen today, 
There's a couple of islands in the South Pacific where guys walk around with these fake guns and they march in this way that they saw you know, 60 years ago people doing, hoping for the, the sort of the blessings to come back to them. And of course, you can imagine, right, anthropologists have a field day with this, right? And like the rituals that we have and how they were developed and, and all kinds of like how it informs religious practice and, and things like that and how this stuff sort of gets misunderstood and practiced and repeated and becomes sort of part of culture. And, and that's pretty interesting. It's also a very good metaphor for how a lot of product design happens, right? Every so often, a product comes out that kind of changes things and everybody like goes, wow, my gosh, like this is new, this is exciting. We've got to do something like this. And that's literally what happens, right? Is you get this sort of mimicking <laughs> behavior, right? Hoping that like, maybe if we just do the right thing, the gods will bless us as well. And that, I see this happening all the time. And frankly, it happens more and more, especially on the web, where you can view source of anything you see and you can just make your own of it. And we see outright copying, right? Which of course is illegal and that doesn't, that doesn't last long. But this sort of derivative nature of it happens all the time, right? Uh, Jason Freed, 37 Signals, um, was talking about this not too long ago, suggesting that like, shouldn't it actually be easier uh, to copy something than to create it, right? And he said, the problem is, that the work on the original is invisible and that the copier, the person copying, doesn't know why it looks the way it looks or feels the way it feels or reads the way it reads, right? You can't see the work that went into it. You just sort of mimic what you see on the outside and hope that it works. And likewise, uh, uh, Dieter Rams, who designed for Braun some of the most iconic uh, consumer electronics uh, in mid-century of last year, said good design is innovative. And we say that all the time, right? Innovation, that's why we're doing startups. We want to innovate, we want to go really fast. And one of his principles for design was that good design does not copy existing product forms, nor does it produce any kind of novelty for the sake of it, which I really like. Which is what we tend to think about when we think about design, right? It's, oh, it's just the type and the color and you know, some of the layout and stuff like that. But that can quickly sort of lead into novelty. I also love this photo because this is back in the days when it was still totally cool to smoke. <laughs> but anyway, it's not like that anymore. So this is the most important word that I can give to you tonight, is that all of the design work that you do for your product should be intentional. It shouldn't just be copying, copying. it shouldn't be derivative, it should be intentional. And having that intention and understanding sort of the process involved and the roles involved in good design can lead you to, do, to make intentional decisions about your product that will work. And I want to give you some vocabulary for this design. And first of all, my definition for design, which is super simple, which is the process of making things for other people. And that's it. That's what I consider design. Some of the tools that I use for design are typography and color and layout and, and things like that. And now interaction and, uh, and time and sound and, and things like that all go into that. But I consider design reaching all the way down into the technology decisions that we make and the business decisions that we make and trying to find a way to be innovative as a startup while practicing what I consider a really good user experience. So let's talk about that process part. Um, I think my former partner Lane is in the audience here somewhere. He, yeah, he, you would roll your eyes just like I always did whenever we would talk about process. Well, you do all the time, <laughs> I know. But I, so process is something that I, probably because we were consulting with Fortune 500 companies and process with a capital P and, and we go through these steps and we're going to switch from this process to agile process and all that kind of stuff. I don't really care. Uh, it drives me nuts. And it, frankly, it it's, tends to be some, uh, a, a proxy for a lot of clear thinking in, in a lot of terms. But I do want to talk about process uh, in terms of the decisions that you make and how intentional they can be. And what I want to show you is based on a couple of things that I've, I've followed lately from Jared Spool, who is a, uh, he's not a designer, he's a user experience research usability, kind of in the Jacob Nielsen school. Uh, and Jess uh, McMullen, who is kind of a design thinker and, and at the more theoretical and academic level. But both of them talking about the kinds of decisions that companies make all the time about the, about the designs that they're doing and their process. And they've kind of identified a bunch of different steps and I've kind of boiled that down into just a few. And I want to talk about those for a minute. And you can think about them as kind of levels of maturity for an organization, for how they do design, how they make decisions about their products. Uh, the first one is unconsidered, right? The design just happened. We were developing a bunch of stuff. The engineers had to have some output for the script. We needed some input from the user. We put some stuff on the screen. That's our design. Um, it could, designers 
with the people who have that job with a capital D, would sort of roll their eyes at this kind of stuff. And I want to make it really clear, I have no level of judgment at all about any of these different sort of maturity models or levels of maturity. I think, frankly, any of these can work at any time for different decisions. But again, those decisions need to be intentional. But unconsidered design can be, for example, very, very successful, right? The only sort of intention that went into this user experience was how simple could we possibly make it? And you can see that if you look back at the first version that came out, it hasn't changed that much in 10 years. And that's great, that's fantastic. It worked for them, but I, having worked there, know that when this came out and it really took off, nobody really knew why, except that it's very simple. Don't change it, don't change it, right? So, so that's great. But it didn't take a lot of sort, there wasn't a lot of research, there wasn't a lot of experimenta experimentation, multivariate testing. No, they made a logo and put a box under it, and that was about it, right? And this happens all the time, right? The Craigslist, another great example of kind of unconsidered design. I guess, I guess we should make a list of all the stuff that you could click on, and I guess we could put it in some kind of order. I think community is important to Craig, so he put that first, right? Like, that's, I think, kind of how about how much thought went into the user experience here, without, with the exception of like, we don't want to like, spend a lot of time on it, and a lot of that stuff seems hard, right? So we're going <laughs> to stick it up there. Lots of open source tools, frankly. This is uh, the mailman mailing list, and I don't know if any of you have ever used this, but this thing drives me nuts. I cannot figure this thing out. It's crazy. It's unconsidered design. It is literally like, you want to we need to have some kind of interface to manage mailing lists. Let's just stick this on it, right? So. And again, that's uh, no judgment. That was probably the appropriate level of, of, um, uh, uh, of effort uh, at the time for an open source project like this, but that's sort of where it goes. The next one is kind of designing for yourself, right? And um, I kind of call that introspective design. That's where I want to make something that's bothering, uh, to, to solve a problem that's really bothering me, right? And this happens all the time, especially in the developer community. Sometimes you get good, solid design skills meshed with uh, very talented designers, and you get stuff like GitHub, right? GitHub is fantastic, it's well designed, but it's designed for a very specific audience, and I would suggest it's the audience that made GitHub is also the audience that this is designed for. So it is an expert tool, right? I'd say 99, 0.9% of the population of, uh, of the world could not, this is incomprehensible, it doesn't make any sense. For that tenth of a percent, it's perfect, right? Because it's designed for the person who's going, designed to be used by the person making it, right? We see this all the time, you know, it's here, uh, Pivotal Tracker from Pivotal Labs, which is a tool I use all the time, and I love this tool. It is designed not only to be used by the guys at Pivotal Lab, but for people who think exactly like them and do not deviate in any way. Um, but it works, it totally works and that's great. So that's another level of design, right? Um, this is a design, so a, a method of design we see all the time with it. it's genius design, right? And probably the best practitioner of this level of design is this guy, right? That is, you ask anybody at Apple and they, they're like, we design for an audience of one, Steve. And we, you know, and then from beyond there, um, he, he has good enough taste that it kind of works out for everybody. And that's totally fine, right? That is a good way of doing design if the person, if the genius doing the design has really good taste. And, and, and that's pretty rare because that taste needs to be sort of accumulated over years and years and years of doing much more sophisticated design practices, I think, right? So genius design is probably fine. There's a great example that Jared Spool uses when he compares uh, some hiking boot website uh, e-commerce websites uh, to REI, right? And most of them fail to REI um, because of the simple fact that REI innovated by turning one of the boots on its side so that hikers could see underneath. And that is because the people at REI had, had worked with people who buy hiking boots for so long, and they were also the people who designed the website, that the photographer was like, of course you show the bottom. Now get away, I gotta take a picture, right? It was, it was they, they completely understood, they didn't do any research whatsoever. They were just like, I'd wanna see the bottom. You know, I, we, everybody we talk to picks up the shoe and looks at the bottom, let's do that, right? So that's sort of the genius design. The way to get there is the sort of final, kind of the most mature way of doing the design, which is really user-centered. And there's tons and tons that has been written about user-centered design. But what I believe is research is the thing that we use to compensate for the fact that we're not geniuses, right? Or that we don't have the luxury of designing for ourselves. 
So user-centered design is kind of the stuff what we did when we did the redesign of Google Analytics. And I'll show you just a couple of the things that, we, that went into this. We talked to hundreds of users and we took really detailed transcripts of the things they said and we, we cut those transcripts apart and, and sort of grouped them and turned them into an overall uh, mental model of the things that people were looking for out of the product. So what we did was a lot of research to help us understand who those users are, what their needs are, uh, and what their desires were to, to use the tool to get things done. We took this, and this, is, this just shows um, the, the sorts of things people were asking us for with the sorts of features that we had available and showed us, frankly, some gaps, right, where we needed to build and design new features and things like that. So really sort of trying to build empathy for the people who would be using the tool every day. Um, again, trying to shorten that gap between um, who we were as the designers and developers and who the users were. Uh, of the product. We did tons of usability testing. This is a lab at Google where you look at the, uh, uh, the we bring users in and they look at the product and we stand, sit behind the glass and watch them like sort of, you know, proper research methodology. This is, in fact, this is a monitor that does, I'm not entirely sure how the technology works, but it kind of shoots laser beams or something into people's eyes so that, um, so that this is what we see on the other side of the glass. We can kind of see where people are looking at the, at the page and stuff like that. It's a pretty sophisticated stuff, right? This is, this is not something that most startups have access to. Um, but it is the kind of stuff that, you know, when you're really sort of optimizing an interface pixel by pixel, you, you can sort of use this stuff and try to understand. So that's sort of the big spectrum of what kind of design should we practice right now, right? Like we've, we've got design decisions that we're making as a startup, as a company in our product and how should we, what level of design? Should we like blow it out and do all the possible user research we can or do we know enough about our audience that we can kind of think it up and feel confident that we're gonna succeed or is this just a tool that our developers are gonna use internally and we can just kind of crank it out really quick? Those are the kinds of things that help you sort of make decisions when you're looking at the screen and everybody is sitting around the conference table and trying to figure out like what is wrong with this thing, that's part of the problem, right? What level of design do we need to practice?